made us in honoring you and glorifying you every day of our lives in Jesus' name. And I hear believing, amen. Well, God bless you as you take your seats. Bishop Abraham spoke about World Congress. And uh, I want to help him to emphasize. I'm expecting every one of you in the World Congress. People are coming from uh, very far places, very far places. I was in Canada a couple of weeks, two weeks ago. And brethren have left Canada. They're already in Nigeria who are coming for the World Congress. And people have left U.S. I was both in Canada and U.S. They are all on, they have, they have started coming to World Congress. I spoke with our pastor in the U.K. two days ago. The U.K. brethren are planning heavily to come for the World Congress. As a matter of time, while they are raising a big, a big amount of money to build a major hostel in the camp. You see? So it's, it's, it's a global fiesta. You can't afford not to be there. We must be there to welcome our brethren that are coming from far and wide. Can I hear you shout a big amen? amen. See you there. See you there. See you there. God bless you. Uh, Justin Simon and Co., you are welcome to church. Uh, well, I'm not welcoming you. I'm welcoming the people that, you, you, that came with you. <laughs> people that came with you. All of you, welcome to church. Amabeda is an exceptional, exceptional, exceptional human being. Somebody superlatively endowed by God to perform a function for him on earth. And I command all of you to pray for him on daily basis. Because he is destined for the heights and nobody can cripple his wings. Nobody. God will not allow. That man has not been born. Who will stop him on his march to, to the heights. God bless you, sir. He shall be well with you in Jesus' name. This morning, let's reflect on this passage of the Bible that you know very much about. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. It says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above. I love this. Exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations Forever and ever, and the church say, Amen. You realize that Paul was in an understandable predicament in trying to communicate in human language what God led in his heart. And so he's appealing for superlatives exceedingly, abundantly, above. What was he trying to communicate? The power of God, the ability of God, and the willingness of God to deploy that supernatural, indescribable ability in favor of man, in favor of those of the human family that trust him. He is able to do, stop it there. God is a God of action. He is not a dormant God who can hear but not act. Who, can, who may see but not do anything. He is a God that is able. He has an indescribable and unlimited ability that cannot be contained in time and space to do whatever he wants to do. But here is a problem. This infinite, this in, 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 infinite power of God may not succeed in being actuated on earth if there is no human vessel. Look at what he says. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we could think or ask according
according to the extent, according to the power that works in us. It is to the extent of the power that works in you that you will experience this infinite power of God in your lives. We will, we will spend the whole week unpacking this thing at the World Congress. Different vessels will come on this, speak on the same thing from all kinds of standpoints. But suffice it was said this morning that the promise of this text is many and varied. Let me give you just a tip of what it says. First, it gives the believer unlimited latitude to dream and to envision. Listen to it again. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Exceedingly abundantly above. Where is the boundary? How do you bound this ability of God? In the depths or in the heights or in the width? This is a boundless expression of the almighty, of the omnipotence of God. He is able. What I think. Now, if God says he's able to do what I ask. That can, be, that can be understood. Because you can only ask up to the point of the vocabulary you can command. When you get to the end of the vocabulary, you can't ask nothing any longer. You just be moping. But he didn't just say that. He said, what I can ask or imagine. Imagination is so, is so unlimited. You can even imagine from here now that you are the president of the world. You can imagine that the, all the wealth of, uh, of, uh, of the world belongs to you. Imagination is, is unstoppable. You can't put a boundary on imagination. But God is committing himself. Unless I don't understand the English he spoke here. If I understand what it means here. He's committing himself not only to do what I could articulate in words, but also do what I could imagine in my mind. So what does that tell me? God has given me unlimited latitude to dream and to envision. In other words, it's like somebody who is thirsty and have been panting for water and suddenly he is dropped there on the shore of the of, 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 of ocean and he's asked to drink as much as he wants. How much of that water do you think he can consume? As much as he wants. As much as his stomach can accommodate. We are like that man who is dropped at the, at the shore of an ocean of divine promises and provisions. And we are asked to collect what you want. And there is a proverb in my village about a bird who perished on a heap of grain. But he could not get enough to fill his mouth. Can you imagine that bed? He is done. He was, he, was, he was placed on a heap, heap of grains, which is the food he eats. And he's asked to go ahead and fill your stomach. But he couldn't get enough to even fill his mouth. That is what is called indolence. It shall not be your portion in Jesus' name. God is giving you time to dream. Hitherto you may not have dreamt, or you may have dreamt limitedly. Now God is giving you an unlimited latitude. Dream as much as you can. Envision as much as you can. And you see how God is going to bless you. 
Stop praying small prayers. Place a demand on God's capacity. And you will see God turn around and do great things for you. Look at what Bible tells us in Genesis as a typical example of what we are discussing here. In Genesis chapter 15 in verse 3. Here is an encounter with God, God and with Abraham. When Abraham saw God, and Abraham told God, said to God, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born of my house is not, indeed, one born of my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look towards the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to number them, and he said, so shall be your descendants. Here was a man looking for a child in an advanced age. As far as biology is concerned, himself and his wife lost the capacity of reproduction. Because said, don't worry, I'm going to give you a child. A couple of years passed, nothing happened. He reminded God of his promise. And God brought him out and said, look at the stars. Count how many stars we have there. If you're able to count that, that is how much children I will give to you. This is God. Manifesting as God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. Abraham wasn't asking for more than one or two sons. But God said, I will give you as many sons as there are stars in heaven. Today, all the Jews all over the world lay claim on Abraham as their father. All the Christians all over the world lay claim on Abraham as their father. All the, all the, the, the Muslims all over the world lay claim on Abraham and their father. And several other sects we are not able to, to know. Every, every person refers to Abraham as his father. Can you see how God has effectively and marvelously fulfilled that promise? If God will do it to Abraham, that same God will do it to you. Now the second thing we see from this promise is that it invites us to make room for God at the points of human extremities. This passage of scripture beckons on you and I to make room for God at the point of our extremities. When we have come to the end of ourselves, when we have exhausted all our power, all our knowledge, all our ability, and we are just there lame. Don't Go into despondency. At that point, remember, there is a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what you ask or think. What that tells us is that God may not be there on time or when he is needed. But he will always arrive on time. He may not be there when you need him. But he will be there when he's supposed to be there. And he will solve the problem for you. That is what we saw. Repeatedly. In the Bible. When Mary and Martha sent a word to him. Your friend Lazarus is sick. The Bible told us Jesus continued doing what he was doing. A couple of days later, he told his apostles, let's go to Bethany. Our friend Lazarus is asleep. Let's go and wake him up. (laughs) 
And they say, look, if Lazarus they sleep now, Lazarus can wake up when he's tired of sleeping. Let's do some other important. He said, don't worry, don't understand me. Lazarus is dead. I'm happy I wasn't there. Let's go there and showcase the glory of God. And they went. Now listen to what happened in that story. You know the story, so I'm not telling the full story. In verse 22, Oh, something very powerful happened. I don't know whether you underlined it in your Bible because many people just gloss over it, but that's the key. But even now, Mary was speaking, Martha was speaking to him. Let me read it from where he began to talk. She began to talk. Verse 21. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Ah, if you were here when I call, sent for you. If you were here when we called you. If you have picked your call at the appropriate time. This tragedy wouldn't have happened. But now, you have arrived too late. You have arrived too late. But then, God seemed to have corrected her immediately. And he expressed that correction in verse 2. In verse 22, but even now, you see, that phrase, even now, is key. But even now, whatever you may ask God, you may ask of God, God will give you. The phrase, even now, means in spite of what has happened. Don't forget that in dealing with God. God is not limited by human calculations or human experiences. God is not limited by human timings. God doesn't have a wristwatch, by the way. God's day is not 24 hours. This is our own. But oftentimes we try to force God into our understanding of space. But it's impossible. Because the space is too small. In fact, I used that phrase in the camp anthem I wrote this morning. This, the, 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 our Congress anthem. I said the, the space is too small for him. You can't, you can't confine God in the space. And so Mata realized that. And so he said, even now, even now, in spite, in spite of what has happened, in spite of the fact that our brother is already dead and have been in the grave for four days, in spite of the fact that you could have done something better and faster if you had been here where he was still alive, even if you even came before he was buried, that would have matter. Okay, if you came only when he has been there for one day, uh, there may be some parts of the body that I can still be retrieved, but you now arrived a little bit late. After four days. However, even now, even now, I know you can still do something. Brother, always allow that window of even now in all your experiences in Jesus' name. Allow the window of even now. Because that is a time of almost of the time God actually works. Well, of course, you know the story. Jesus said, where did you lay him? Mother said, oh, guy, don't tell you. This man did this smell now. Just leave it. It's okay. Jesus said, just take me to where you laid him. And when he got there, Jesus said, be totally unexpected. Remove the stone. Mother said, oh, guy, this is a mess of a thing. But eventually they did. And Jesus, his characteristic way of doing things, Tapping into the infinite capacity and power of God in his life. He didn't scream. He didn't shout. He groaned in his spirit. And he said one word. Lazarus, comfort. And that was it. That dead man. Bound leg, hand, head, everything. I don't know how he got up. But when you go home today, try it out. Get somebody to tie your leg together. Tie your hand, tie your head. And lay you perpendicular on the ground. Ask you to get up. Let's see how quickly we do that. That guy got out from that grave. He didn't just get up. He came out. How did he walk? With legs bound. When God's power is released in you. 
impossibilities becomes possible. When God's power is unleashed in your life, impossibility becomes illogical. The God we serve is a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what you ask or what you think. Peter, in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, again demonstrated the fact that we must make room for God at the points of our extremities. This guy is, was a professional fisherman, and he knows by fish culture, they come out in the night to look for food to eat. That's their hunting time. And that is the time they are caught. That's the time fishermen. That's why fishermen fish in the night, not in the day. But in the day, the sun is up there, it disturbs the fish, so they go down to the bed of the sea to rest and sleep and enjoy themselves. Peter went out to catch fish all night. And Peter didn't catch anything. Not even a finger lay. And that guy discouraged, was washing his net, ready, getting ready to go home. And here comes There was no indication that they have met before. But I'm sure he must have listened to Jesus, or must have perceived that there is something extraordinary about this young man, about this guy. Jesus approached and said, who has this boat? Peter said, I'm you. Can you move a little bit inside the water? Let me use it to preach. Peter obeyed. When God makes a demand on you, he may look small, but he may, he may be setting you up for a great blessing. Don't say no to him. That's why people should not play with small things as paying tithe. He, he looks small, and people sometimes neglect it. But don't. Those small things may be opportunity God is looking for to set you up for blessing. Peter didn't know God was setting him up for blessing. And so he released his boat for Jesus to use to preach the gospel. And when Jesus was done with the preaching, he told Peter, Oh God, Peter, drop your net and catch some fish. Peter laughed and said, This man doesn't understand. We fished all night and we didn't catch anything. Is it this afternoon? And the Bible expositors, we are saying that when Jesus and Peter were having this you know, in, you know, a discussion. It should be, it should be around two p.m. So the sun is really up there, shining bright. Peter said, "All night we labored, we didn't catch a fish. I don't think it's going to work out now." But again, you see, Peter make a statement. If you check it out in Luke chapter five, verse five, Peter said, "Nevertheless." Nevertheless, again, that is that phrase. That is that window that you must allow for God to intervene in your case. At the point of your failure, at the point of your dis, you know, despair, Peter said, nevertheless. What does nevertheless mean? Despite anything on the contrary. Despite Anything on the contrary, I will drop my note. Not necessarily because they will catch, but just to satisfy your curiosity. But Peter didn't know who he was talking with. That this guy is the creator of the fish. And when Peter dropped his net with the hand of Jesus on that net, it becomes a privilege for the fish to be caught in that net. All the heterobranchus in that sea, all the heterotis, all the tilapia, all the salmon, all of them, they began to take a race from the east of the Mediterranean Sea, of, of, of Sea of Galilee, sorry, to the west, to the south, to the north. All the fishes were rushing to go and enter the net because it became an honor for Peter's net to catch any fish because the master is there. That will be your experience in the name of Jesus. That is the God we worship. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask or think through the power that works in us. Yes, 
Peter caught so much fish that when he looked at the fish and uh, expressed his experience, something became obvious. This man I'm dealing with, he is not an ordinary human being. He bowed down and said, okay, depart from me because I am not qualified to be in your company. I am a sinful man. Listen to me. We have God who thinks about us. He thinks about us beyond what you can ever imagine. Now here is the third point. A third thing that this passage will tell us. It tells us that the present is not all there is to life. There is a future beyond the present. We may ignore the past, but oftentimes we build our everything, including our theology, on the present. Oftentimes, we capitalize on the present in defining our life and interpreting the dynamics of our life experiences. But this passage is telling me, beyond the present lies the future. The present may be a, a, a living reality, but the future can provide a superior reality. Don't limit yourself with who you are today. There is a better you, a better version of you beyond now. Look beyond today and see the possibilities of tomorrow. You know, sometimes I tell my wife, what if you didn't marry me that time I came? Because I didn't look like somebody anybody should marry. I wore one concourse off. I wore one gym that, okay, rat ate a part of it because I poured on it one night. And rat editing. I didn't bother myself. And I wore one rubber slippers. And I put on my equipment so come back. And I went to Ibadan to go and I meet the parents. <laughs> the father took one look at me and said, This is a strange man. He walked upstairs. There's nothing to talk about with this man. And I didn't, it didn't occur to me to dress well. I just felt that, well, that's, that's me, that's, it, that's who I am. But mommy did knew me because we are in one fellowship at Atif at that time. So he knows that even though I don't look good, but there is a fire burning inside of me. And I'm sure he saw that fire in the future. And he said, in spite of who you are in the present, I am marrying you because of your tomorrow. Tell your neighbor, I am going with you because of your tomorrow. Look, even if you want to abandon yourself, even if you want to reject yourself, even if you want to curse yourself, remember, there is a tomorrow for you. There is a tomorrow for you. There is a tomorrow for you. Because God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask or think through the power that works in us. Where there is certainly, there may be today, there may, there may be an experience of failure today. Like, Many of us, if not all of us, but many of us at least, including me, have failed in some areas, in certain things we try to do. But because we know that the possibility, the experience of failure creates a possibility of success. If I could fail, then I may succeed. Are you getting the point? If, if, if I try to do it and I fail, it could be that if I try again tomorrow, I may succeed. We see that that passage assures us of that. 
The Bible said that weeping may occur in the night, but in the morning, there will be joy. Don't build your theology on your weeping. Don't market your misery as your business. See, it is a passing phase in your life. There is a greater opportunity tomorrow. There is a better life tomorrow. Bear that in mind at all times. There can be no today, there can be a no today. You may do something or you may even go to a, ask a man or a woman or somebody you respect to help you and he says no. That no is only for today. You may go back tomorrow and get a resounding yes. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think through the power that's at work in us. I can be delayed, but I cannot be stopped. I want you to think of it. Because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what I ask or think, it is possible for me to experience a delay, but it's impossible for me to be stopped. I will overcome the delay. And continue my journey. I can be challenged in life. And of course a life that with your challenge. We have no testimonies. But you know what? I cannot be conquered by any of those challenges. Every challenge is an opportunity to experience triumph. Because there is a God. Who is able to do. Exceedingly. Abundantly. Above what we ask. Or think. Let this thought linger strong in your heart. Let this thought constitute the bedrock upon which you develop your worldview. Life is not all about you. There is God involved in it. You are not the architect of your life. There is a master designer an unfathomable brain who fashioned you. Who is washing over you. Who will perfect his counsel in your life. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask of him. Let's bow our head and pray together. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think through the power that is at work in our lives. This morning I challenge you to trust this God. This morning I challenge you to navigate this ocean of promise and see how much you can get out of it. Because you can never exhaust this infinite abyss of divine love mingled with mercy that is available to you as a believer. No, you cannot. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above. What are those areas of defeat in your life? Say that defeat enough is enough. You cannot be defeated. Because God in his infinite wisdom has pronounced you as more than conquerors. So defeat is an aberration in your life. You can be delayed like I said but you cannot be stopped. When people trust God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what they ask or think, they can be stopped. Think of David. They tried to stop him from challenging Goliath. But David said no. They gave him armor, borrowed armor. But the Bible said David couldn't walk with that borrowed armor. And just David used what God has enabled him to learn. Based on his experience, he went with his catapult. And with a catapult, the strongest man in the world called Goliath. That may be your own experience. Your glory will fall today. 
as you trust God and go with what God has given you. Forget about man's definition of you. Forget about man's characterization of you. Hang on what God said concerning you. The Bible tells me that God is thinking about me and he stored for me a thought of good and not of evil because he wants to bring me to his own expected end of me. I receive God's expected end of me. Not your own expected end. You may see me today as failure. But God is seeing me as a success. You may see me today as a problem. But God is seeing me as a solution. What has God said to you concerning you? This is the time to resuscitate it. And hold it strong. Because God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what he asks or think through the power that's at work in you. As we round off this prayer at this time, I want to remind you that the greatest blessing God can bestow a man is to enable that man to be his child. Anything an unbeliever can get with their trust in Jesus is not qualified to be called a blessing. In other words, majority of the things we clamor and call that they are blessings are actually not blessings. Because an un there, are, there is nothing you have today that you don't know an unbeliever who got it without believing in Christ. What is your prayer point today is not a prayer point to so many unbelievers around you. And so how can that be a prayer point? How can that be the blessing? Anything an unbeliever can acquire without praying, without trusting Jesus, a believer should not present it as a favor, as a blessing from God. Does that make sense to you? Now, if that becomes the case, what then do you consider blessings in your life? The greatest of all of those blessings is the salvation of your soul. That is why Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he will gain the whole world and lose his soul? What can a man give in exchange to his soul? So if you are in this auditorium this morning, and you have all the material things the world has. You have all the material things that unbelievers have without praying. But you do not, uh, you are not sure of your placement in Christ. I want to invite you to give your life to Christ now. And if there is any such person, if there is any such person in church, can you wave your hand? Let me see where you are. I can pray for you. Is there any such person in church? Because only Jesus can truly satisfy. The second blessing we have to seek for is that God will grant you the opportunity, the privilege of being satisfied in him. When we were young Christians, many, many years ago, when we were still on the campuses, one of the most popular songs we used to sing in those days is that, I have Jesus, I lack no more, I lack no more. I lack no more. And many of us, we are thinking that we are not sure of where our school fees will come the next, next semester. And I didn't understand. Why can we be singing that? But now I understand. All of those material things that an unbeliever can get, unbelievers can pay their school fees with their praying. 
they can't be compared with your relationship with Christ. And if Jesus is not your ultimate satisfaction, whatever is, is the God you worship. I'm not sure you got me. Whatever satisfies you more than Jesus is the God you worship. Jesus ought to be our ultimate satisfaction. If there is anything that you crave for satisfaction beyond Jesus, you are an idol worshiper. Think about that. And if there are such, we have used materialistic gospel to derail people from the curtains of faith. But Jesus is our ultimate satisfaction. My brother, come here. You want to give your life to Christ? Look at me. Look at my face now. Uncle, what's your name? Yeah? David. Henry. Henry Simon. Simon. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless Henry Simon. Henry Simon, do you want to give your life to Jesus? Yeah? You wish you can, but why can't you? Now you can. Say, I can. Say after me. Heavenly Father, I want to give my life to Jesus. Not because I want, but because you brought me here this morning. And having brought me, I know there is a blessing for me. I received that blessing. Blessing of new birth. Blessing of forgiveness of sin. Blessing of transformation of character. Blessing of indwelling presence of Jesus. In my life. I surrender my heart to you. And I work on you in my heart. Make me your child. Even as you use the blood, your blood to cleanse me and wash away every sin in my life. Take control of me. I reject the devil and all his agents and all his desires and all his pleasures. I embrace Jesus. My ultimate satisfaction. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. Say a big amen. Father I bless Henry Simon. And I break the yoke of the devil over his life. And I decree that this young man will serve you. To the honor and glory of your name in Jesus name. Take him away and answer him. Now stand on your feet and wave your hand to God. And say after me Heavenly Father. Where I bless you from the very depth of my heart. I crave with all my soul. That Jesus Christ. Becomes my ultimate satisfaction. I crave. With all my heart. That Jesus. Becomes my ultimate satisfaction. I pray. That Jesus will become my ultimate satisfaction. That is what marks me out as a Christian. May I find pleasure in nothing more except in Christ from today onwards. May the satisfaction of my soul be based on my relationship with Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I present this congregation before you today. And I rebuke every work of Satan in anybody's life. Every sickness in any shape or form. Every situation of appendicitis that is about to rupture. I decree total healing and restoration in the lives of God's children at this moment in the name of Jesus Christ. Every issues of sleeplessness, of incessant worries about life,
and life conditions. All of those things that seem to distract us from focusing on him for whom we are. And by whom we are. I come against them. And I command that henceforth, every single one of us in church this morning would experience the joy of the Lord in his fullest dimension in the name of Jesus Christ. The peace of God will be our portion in the name of Jesus Christ. The joy of the Holy Spirit will be our experience in the name of Jesus. We receive power from heaven to overcome. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. We have the capacity to trample upon serpents and upon scorpions and over all the powers of the enemies and nothing shall by enemies hurt us. Let that be our lingering experience in the name of Jesus. Father, I bless this congregation and I ask you to bless us. And let your name be glorified in our lives. We have prayed in Jesus' name. Can I hear you shout a big amen? Hallelujah. I am glad I am here this morning. I am blessed so.